So my name is Lisa Goldman. I direct the Israel-Palestine Initiative at New America, uh, which is a nonpartisan think tank located in Washington, D.C., although I work out of the New York office and I'm currently at, at home in Brooklyn. Um, Dalia, you just uh, you recently finished your PhD. You live in Tel Aviv. I'm going to ask you in a sec to talk about um, what you did your what you wrote your dissertation on and uh, what kind of work you're engaged in right now. And uh, Dove, you're at Northeastern University, also a recent appointment. And we'll get to you after Dalia. So Dalia, just start and tell us what you're working on and what your background is. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, professionally, I'm a public opinion researcher and a political consultant. I've been working in political research for 15 years, roughly since 1999, including mm -hmm. uh, work on, his, on election campaigns. So I've worked on four national election campaigns in Israel and in about 15 other countries. Um, I also did recently complete my PhD at Tel Aviv University in political science, um, looking at unrecognized states or unilaterally declared states. Um, and I teach adjunct at Tel Aviv University as well. And I'm also a proud writer and blogger on 972 Magazine. And a runner. Yes, and I'm training for a, a marathon. So impressive. Uh, and, and Dov, uh, you're at Northeastern. That's also a recent. You were at CUNY until this year. And then you moved to Northeastern. You took over a rather impressive standing job. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and what you're doing right now. Yes, yeah, so I've recently joined the faculty at Northeastern University. Um, my title, I'm a professor of political science, international affairs and Israel studies there. Um, so I have different appointments and I'm also the co-director of the university's Middle East Center. Um, so at Northeastern, I teach courses on the Arab-Israeli conflict and international relations. Um, and I'm currently writing a book about the politics of Israel in the American Jewish community and the growing debate over Israel among American Jews. The liberal Zionism debate. Um, it goes beyond that. Um, I mean, that's one aspect of it, but it's much uh, more broadly about uh, the changing relationship between American, uh, between Amer the American Jewish community in Israel, uh, the, the growing divisions over Israel uh, among American Jews and the impact that's having more broadly upon American Jewish politics today. I actually heard you speak really, uh, in, you give a really interesting interview uh, to t TLZ1 when you were in Israel this past summer. Um, right, yeah, right. Uh, I listen to podcasts a lot when I'm cooking, and that was that was a good one. <laughs> good. Um, so the three of us uh, know each other. We've socialized, and we share a lot of ideas. And um, one of the ideas that we started talking about was um, looking at different state models for Israel-Palestine that go beyond this binary uh, uh, of one state or two state. And I think you know both of us, and um, we can discuss this as well. But I think both all three of us feel that um, you know the two state model. You know, leaving aside the issue of of, um, of ethnic particularism or however you want to express it, that the two-state model might be the most pragmatically workable one. But it, you know, given political realities um, and the situation on the ground, that uh, and this and this this the sort of very very stalled um, diplomatic initiatives coming from the states, that that the two-state um, solution might just not be practical. Um, am, am I, do we agree on that, or is well? Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily dismiss it outright and saying it's impractical. I just think it's important to expand the conversation. Uh, rather than at the moment, I think uh, for a long time we've been very stuck in uh, this kind of binary mode of thinking, where we we where it's either a two state or one state. Um, and I think it's important to to kind of expand the range of possibilities. That's not necessarily a question of of saying that a two state uh, the two state option or varieties of that are no longer feasible, but simply that it's important to to think beyond, you know, just one or two options, and that is, in fact, a wider range of possibilities, and I think that can kind of invigorate, if you like, the uh, political discussion about how to resolve this conflict. I think it's important to point out that, that no particular solution to this conflict is going to be convenient. This is not a, if it was so convenient, we wouldn't be in a conflict, and we wouldn't have had so much problems reaching a solution. Uh, the fact is that there have been negotiations for about 23 years now, if you start counting with the Madrid process in 1991, uh, based on the two st general two-state formula, and it, they haven't really worked, and that's not because they can't work, but there are changing facts on the ground that cause a lot of people on the ground to say it's going to be increasingly hard to implement the classic formula of the two-state solution, and as a result, there are many people on the ground who are already thinking about different options. So it's not so much whether we think the two-state solution is feasible or not, no solution is going to be easy. But as long as the, there are, you increasingly hear terms being 
thrown about on the ground. Um, you know, in, back in the past, there's been talk about one state. Most people think that's completely unrealistic. And then you started hearing, I would say, within the last few years, more and more from you know various figures in civil society, uh, from the left, from the right, about different models. And we start we started to realize that you know people are throwing around terms like confederation and federation and consociational models. But it wasn't really clear what people really meant and if they understood one another. And so we think that it's not so much that we advocate the need to embrace one of these other solutions, but that there are other things in the air uh, that, as Dill pointed out, really do break down this kind of binary division between one and two states. And we think it's a mistake for the entire discourse, certainly the discourse abroad, to look at the picture as if it's all about either two states or one state. Right, and I think that's super important because um, sometimes when you're groping your way toward um, a solution, you need to, you know, you you might the solution might not be apparent, but having the conversation can make it. it that's part of the process of making it become apparent. Um, and I th I think that's something that I I've, I've been it's been really difficult lately to just focus on that and, and think about it intelligently. And I think that the two of you have really helped me a lot to put some order to my thoughts with, um, with the ideas that uh, you sent me for the various state models. And, and I wanted to talk about that briefly. And I'm, Dove, I'm wondering if you can start with that and just, um, just broadly outline the sort of six paradigms um, for uh, of state models. And then, and then we can talk about what they mean and what their implications might be. Sure. Well, well first of all, when we talk about um, you know, one state or two state, we often basically have in mind the simple issue of partition or no partition. And this is the, the, the historic debate, of course, that goes back uh, all the way to the 1930s and the Peel Commission report over how to resolve this conflict. Um, but within these two possibilities of partition, uh, no partition, there are actually more options. So uh, from one end of the spectrum, the, the partition, um, we distinguish between um, what we would call a very hard partition Right, which involves the establishment of uh, two sovereign states. Right, this is the classic two-state model. But within that, there are two options. One is a kind of ethnic separation model, uh, according to which um, this is essentially the notion of two states for two peoples. So there'll be a Jewish state of Israel for the Jewish people, existing alongside a Palestinian state for the Palestinians. And in that model, which uh, we often associate with. Um, with people like Uhud Barak, who, who, who kind of famously said, you know, us here, them over there. Um, that, that leaves open the question of, of, for instance, what would be the future of Palestinian citizens in Israel? Uh, what would be the future of, of Jewish settlers who now live in the West Bank? So that's one two-state model. The other one is a territorial separation without ethnic division. Um, this is the kind of two-state model that we associate particularly with uh, Labour Party or the Meretz Party. Which means, and what, sorry, leaving the settlers in the West Bank? Which, which, which po could mean leaving um, some settlers in the West Bank, but it means, um, you know, not having this notion of kind of ethnic division so much as territorial, uh, territorial separation and strong formal links between uh, the state, a, a state, an Israeli state and a Palestinian state. But the Israeli state isn't regarded solely as a state for one people. Yeah, I think the distinction between those is important because what you're looking at is an ethnic separation. The principle is that two people cannot live together. And one state needs to be designated for the Jewish people primarily, and the other state needs to be designated for the Palestinian people primarily. And they don't really put an emphasis on minority rights or equality. Uh, whereas the territorial separation is saying, well, we have two uh, zones for the two different people, but you know both of them are going to be de developed in a way that embraces their minorities, which is a distinction that we see certainly uh, being made by our current Israeli foreign minister, who supports total ethnic separation to the point of yes. actually transferring citizenship uh, or stripping people of their citizenship if they don't belong in the Jewish state. Yeah, which is uh, incredible. So, yeah, so we're talking basically it, it, um, within the two-state option, one is two ethnic states and the other is two states which allow for um, the possibility of ethnic and national minorities to, to exist uh, and coexist within them. Do we have any um, historical precedents for these models? Sure. Uh, <laughs> plenty, of, <laughs> plenty of countries have separated over the, last, um, over the last 20 years in particular. Pretty much all the countries, many of the countries that were established since the fall of communism were essentially right. separation models, yeah. various kinds of separation models. Uh, specific examples such as no sorry to press that I know I'm being a bit disingenuous but just for, for the viewers if we can if we can give a specific example that everyone might be familiar with 
um, Czechoslovakia. The separation yeah. of Czech Republic and Slovakia was one of the most peace, one of the more peaceful separations of people mm -hmm. um, by sort of agreement, and and there was no war fought, which is which makes it a little bit unique in terms of the uh, in terms of the other sort of separation models, which you know you can think of former Yugoslavia, which broke up very in a very bloody way, um, right. and essentially led to what we might call mostly a territorial separation, not the ethnic separation, because even though they were fought, the wars were fought along ethnic lines, ultimately you have a number of successor states that do involve minorities of other communities. So they've had to make, uh, a, so they had to come to an understanding of those successor states that they, you know, account for and embrace minority rights. Whereas in the in in an earlier period, I mean, if we go back to the nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties, and nineteen forties, you see more commonly the notion of ethnic separation. Think about uh, Greece and Turkey and the exchange of Greek Greeks and Turks and the establishment of uh, modern Turkey and, um, and also, of course, India and Pakistan, which although they, they left uh, substantial minorities, this was this notion essentially that Pakistan would be for the Muslim population and India would be for the Hindu population and other minorities. So and obviously those kinds of hard partitions have uh, historically resulted in, you know, in a lot of uh, ethnic conflict and violence. Right. Ethnic cleansing, which certainly was the basis for the Balkan Wars as well. Sure, I, and that I think that might also be one of one of the you know there are so many fears that um, even unex, unex, unexpressed fears uh, amongst the populations in, in both Palestinian and Israeli populations about you know what what might be involved in the process of separation and specifically bl this bloody violence that we've seen in historical precedents. So you know what kind of safeguards can we can we put up? Can we find to make sure this doesn't happen? when or if Israel and Palestine separate into two sovereign states? Well, I mean, I think the most important thing to do is make sure that separation happens by agreement. I mean, there's no better argument for reaching an agreement rather than allow this kind of thing to happen by, you know, violence and bloodshed, which is pretty much what is happening now. Although, ironically, with all the violence and bloodshed in this region, it still, what's going on on the ground is increasing integration, less separation. Not exactly right, integration, I, yeah. but, you know, increasing... Um, um, overlapping of populations rather than separation. Despite the violence, it's quite it's quite an unusual situation. The, the parties fight and fight with each other, uh, mm. and at the same time they continue to be increasingly intertwined, which is exactly why we have this kind of complex Gordian knot of how to untie them. And that's why that's exactly what leads to this question. Right. And so the, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I would just say the other thing um, in any sort of uh, partition, hard partition, um, you know, you have to ensure um, a minority rights regime as well. So it's particularly to guarantee the rights of the Palestinian Arab minority in Israel would be essential to ensuring that, you know, it doesn't lead to a situation uh, of the more ethnic separation where it increases the uh, desire of some within Israel, within the hard right within Israel for the uh, transfer or removal or simply stripping the citizenship of Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel. So I think you ha also have to have some sort of guaranteed and not merely, you know, uh, on paper, but actually enforced legally uh, rights, um, minority rights. But, that, but right. the, the very interesting point there is that, of course, if there's a complete separation of two states that have no particular uh, uh, obligation to be connected to one another, then Israel really has no say in how the Palestinian state would treat its minorities. Uh, and that well, makes... uh, yeah, but I think neither side has a responsibility to the other. That seems to be, like, the issue of trust seems to be a major, major stumbling point here, no? Yes. Absolutely. And, and, tr and with good reason, because the parties yeah. are, on, the, on, the ongoing violent hostility makes, is the reason for that lack of trust. It's not just out of nowhere. Sure, and also the fact that, um, you know, I think maybe even the majority of the population of Gaza and the West Bank are refugees who come, who regard their homes as being originally inside of uh, what's now called Israel, the 1948 boundaries. So, you know, there are a lot, a lot of things involved in, in discussing a separation. Amongst them, you know, no, you're not actually, your aspiration to go home is not, is not going to come to pass. Exactly. That's one of, I mean, one of the major issues is who gets to live where. I mean, it, you know, in a, in a separation, it really forces the issue, right? Who has rights to live where? Where do, uh, where do where, what to do with, the, uh, with Jewish settlers? What to do with Palestinian refugees? What to do with Palestinian citizens of Israel? And that's what, you know, some of those are, are the major issues, uh, not to mention the difficulty of carrying out that, uh, that kind of separation. Which, um, which is why some advocates now are pointing to what we would call a kind of soft partition model. A soft partition model uh, doesn't, doesn't involve um, the, the, the complete hard separation of partition, uh, but it somewhere, exists somewhere uh, in a, along this spectrum.
Uh, actually, I mean, not that this is a very good example of soft partition, but you kind of see this emerging in Iraq and other places as well, where even if you don't have separate, two completely separate states, you have um, different spheres of sovereignty, let's say, or different areas of, of control. I think we probably just chose a really scary example with Iraq. Um, can, we, can we think of something that um, might be a bit more of a successful... The EU. EU. I think that's probably the best example. I mean, they make a big effort not to call themselves a confederation, but when you think about it, you know, barely just over half a century ago, these were countries that were tearing each other apart and butchering their people. And today, we, you know, a big portion of Western Europe is basically in an extremely sort of mutually beneficial uh, arrangement where you have completely sovereign states, but who have willingly subsumed pieces of their sovereignty to an overarching structure. And, you know, with all sorts of, um, with all the dilemmas this raises, the countries you know, may, may be struggling a bit with their identity, but they don't feel threatened in their sovereignty so deeply yet that anybody's formally pulled out of the arrangement because of the benefits that arrangement brings and the mutual guarantees it brings to the people from everywhere in that zone, that when they go to the other countries in that zone, they have certain basic rights and protections. Right, and those, those rights and protections go beyond the economic rights that the EU, you know, a lot of cynics when they um, said that the EU is really just about an economic confederation, but in fact it's, it's more than that, and I wonder if you can just say a bit about that. Yeah, well, well let, let's, let, in terms of what this might mean for Israel Palestine, the idea is that you have um, two states which reflect the national identities and aspirations of both peoples, but in terms of their governance arrangements, there's kind of a lot, there's a lot of pooled sovereignty as exists in the EU and there's shared governance. So a lot of the, on the European level, you know, uh, many, many aspects of day-to-day -day life in Israel, are in, in, in the EU, are, are collectively governed, right? While on the one hand, different states um, have ultimate sovereign powers in the areas of foreign affairs, taxation, etc. There's a lot on transportation, healthcare, uh, for instance, where which are, which are communally decided essentially, um, and so that that it would be something along those lines where um, both the, uh, where you would have two states, a state, an Israeli state and a Palestinian state, but um, on many many aspects of day to day life, they would be uh, they would pool their sovereignty and 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 govern collectively essentially. Okay. Um, so that again, that that requires. I mean, a lot of people say about Europe that this. I, mean, I don't want to dwell too much on the comparison, but you know, Europe is Western Europe is very much of a post-conflict society, right? I mean, this the twentieth century was one of enormous uh, bloodletting. I mean, millions and millions, tens of millions of people were killed in the two wars. Um, do you think that perhaps we're not? Um, sorry to be cynical. Tired enough of the killing in Israel Palestine for this model to? Be adopted. I don't well, know I how much longer you a... have to wait uh, to you know to keep killing people. Sorry, sorry, Dill, but that's a, quite an emotional question for those of us who actually live here. And I think I may be the only one of us who live in this region. How much more tired do I have to get? I mean, the bloodshed goes back about a century at this point. Um, you know, you can certainly look at peaks, but we've had many such peaks uh, after this summer. We had what we see on the ground is an accelerating pace of warfare. For one thing, you had you know war in Gaza between 2008 and nine end of 2008, early 2009, then we had another war in 2012, now another one in 2014, and most people don't think we're going to last another year without having another war. I mean, right. I, I, you know, for one thing, let's turn around the old adage, one is, one is too many. None is too many. In terms of deaths, how many more people need to die? Sorry to sound like a hippie, but the conflict has been going on for plenty of time. I mean, we shouldn't look at, we can't look at the start of the, 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 of the war and the conflict as 1948, 67, or 48, because we have to look at when the bloodshed started, mm. and that goes way back. Yeah, I would just go back to the question of how uh, the, that kind of uh, confederal arrangements evolve. I, I don't think it would be realistic to expect, you know, automatically for these two, uh, for two states to, you know, completely pull their sovereignty. I mean, if we look at the EU and is, as an example, that emerges over time. They start off with, you know, coal and, uh, coal and steel. So we're talking about functional, specific areas of, uh, of cooperation, of shared governance, whether that be, for instance, in the environment or water resources. or um, And then that expands over time. So incrementally. Um, Increment, yeah, increment. But, yeah, but the idea, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I think it's also about expectation management on some level. I mean, you know, I think that we have to put to rest the idea that any one arrangement, any one political arrangement or peace agreement will suddenly magically eradicate all violence in the region. That won't happen, and guess what? It won't happen anywhere in the world. 
Uh, what it will do is create a framework by which violence can be contained and that every stone thrown doesn't have to turn into a full-blown war because there will be a political arrangement in place to contain it. Um, and so I don't think anybody has time to wait for that to happen as long as we understand that there will be incidents of violence, there will be violations, and that's not a reason to scrap the progress right. in reaching a political arrangement. So we've talked about a couple of models, and there were, there were also some, we've, we've talked about cons sort of economic confederations and about, um, you know, an ethnic division or um, a division that has, that's not, that, that has ethnic minorities with full, with full citizens' rights. What other models are there that, that we're looking at? Uh, so the next model on our on our list of um, this also falls under the category of what we would call soft partition is a federal state. Right. Um, so so here we start moving toward var variations of what we would call a one state model, but in a, but it, so we, we would still label a federal state soft partition because uh, essentially it it involves um, two distinct um, self governing entities. Um, uh, they exist within the framework of one sovereign state, but really we're talking about a high degree of territorial and communal autonomy within that state. And they are still fairly defined regions within the, within the broader space. Right, so you're looking at the Galilee, which has a high concentration of Palestinian citizens of Israel and that sort of thing? Well, I was thinking more of the West Bank and Gaza versus uh, Israel proper, but, you know, I mean, who knows how they will be defined? They could also be defined in yeah. terms of regions or districts or cantons. Yeah, it does, or, or population. I mean, so there's two ways. When you think about autonomy, there's one way to to uh, organize that is territorially. So you define it by, you know, is as, as Dahlia suggested, uh, the Israel within the Green Line, West Bank, Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, and they have uh, that. That would be one way of doing it. The other way would be population or communal autonomy. So um, basically, you know, different different groups, specifically uh, Palestinians and Jews, would have. Uh, would be largely autonomous and self-governing within the framework of one state. Mm -hmm. And what are the uh, possible pitfalls in that kind of an arrangement? That they can't well, possibly come to an agreement over how to govern the, the communal structures of the state. I mean, it is essentially mm -hmm. one federal state. Um, right. Look at the problems with a single, with a single parliament, a single legislature. I mean, look at the problem America has as a federated state just governing itself. You know, there's so much tension between <clears throat> the, the, the desire for, you know, laws and customs that reflect local um, you know, ways of being. And those are communities that theoretically are all American. Considering that there is no real civic identity here and you have two communities that are very, very distinctly different, <clears throat> they may not come to any agreement on the, on the overall federal structures. I mean... Well, that's, yeah, that's one challenge. The other challenge is that it, it, it perpetuates uh, ethnic divisions, if you like. It's a model that's built upon um, rec the recognition of difference and allowing these two different communities to govern themselves, and therefore, rather than um, you know promoting um, the establishment of, as Dalia said, a kind of common civic identity, uh, and ultimately a shared sense of national identity, you have the promotion and the perpetuation of of, of these two distinct uh, ethnic national groups. And you you can see an example of this, for instance. I mean, if we take you know um, Canada. As an example, right? The the that's a that's a model which allows the Quebecois, the French Canadians, to a large degree of of self rule. But that also ensures that Canada that there is a weak sense of kind of common Canadian identity. Yeah, and as right? a Canadian, two... I can speak to that. Yeah, exactly. So although it's a vibrant the, the... debate, and you know, having also a Canadian uh, uh, element to my citizenship, I should say, uh, having lived there as well, I feel like you know that kind of identity tension was a healthy tension there. You know, there is a healthy debate going on. I, I, I wasn't living there when things were tense, but the fact is they were only violent and tense for a very short phase. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, the, the, the violence that, uh, um, that occurred in the early 1970s when Trudeau was uh, prime minister was, was temporary. It was a glitch. It certainly left a scar, like no one's really forgotten it. But it was quickly contained because you had yeah. a working federal structure. Yeah, it didn't right, spread. Right. It didn't turn into civil war. No, no. But then we also have the Yugoslav example of another federal state that did eventually turn into, obviously, a very brutal civil war. So, I mean, in, in each one of these cases that, that we can find, uh, you know, we can find positive, relatively positive examples and, and, and negative examples. And as, as Dalia said, I, I don't think our, our, we see our, we, it's important to kind of think about what, which what are the possibilities? What are the what potential lessons do each of these uh, previous examples offered to the case in Israel-Palestine. Obviously, every every 
conflict is in some sense unique. And so uh, we have to be creative in thinking about how to apply these specific examples. Um, and, and as Dahlia said as well, none of them are going to be perfect. None of them are, are going to involve uh, no tensions or even no violence initially. So um, we, we're, we're talking about a, a, a situation which uh, dials down the conflict um, which re significantly reduces conflict and brings about more fairer outcomes. And so, also, and I, in terms of our, sorry, just in terms of our research, I mean, one of the things we're looking at is to try to explore each of these models, and we have a couple more we can talk about, but to yeah. really see if they answer the key, you know, most urgent needs of this conflict. And, you know, this is not because we're advocating one of them. So as far as we're concerned, if we research any one of these models and find out that they really fail to answer some of those basic needs, we will probably conclude that those aren't very ideal models, even if right. even if they are in the public discourse right now. Yeah, and I, I, that's why this project in, in, intrigues me so much, and it's so important to me. So um, I think that's it's a very good methodology to look at the pros and cons of, of these various models, and and then see how they apply to the specific situation on the ground. And there are, you know, we can't leave out the emotional aspects, like trust, for example. But you know, it's 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 way too big of a topic. Um, for this interview, but I'm just going to put that out there uh, to be discussed at a further uh, at, at another time. Um, but um, I'd like you first to talk about the other the the final two models um, just briefly, and then uh, one of the things that also interests me is who is doing research on these various models, and I'm particularly interested. Obviously, all three of us were all Jewish. Uh, Dali and I are, uh, both have Israeli citizenship. Um, I lived there for a long time. Um, what about the Palestinian academics or the Palestinian academics who are citizens of Israel and who teach at universities in Israel and who are or who work at think tanks in Israel and who are doing research into these models? What are what are they looking at? What do they favor and why? Um, so if you can just first talk about these the other two models on the list and then we'll get to the to to the academics who are looking into these various models. Okay, um, so uh, the the last two are we, we would cl classify them under no partition. Uh, these are often referred to as simply one state, but in fact, one state, uh, so-called one state solutions uh, break. Uh, there, there are two different kinds of one state solutions. One is uh, a one a bi one binational state. This is a state that explicitly recognizes that there are, uh, as as the name suggests, two uh, nations within it, um, and 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 with and and based upon that recognition. Uh, government power uh, is divided according to some kind of uh, particular power sharing formula. Like in um, Lebanon, for example. Like in Lebanon. I mean, that's a consociation. That's not, uh, that's, that's a multi-confessional model rather than a binational model. But it's the same idea of having a, a power sharing system of government, essentially, which recognizes these distinct communities and allocates power um, accordingly. Um, the other kind of model is is one that does not recognize uh, at all uh, distinct national or ethnic groups within it. This is just simply one unitary democratic state. I mean, the you know, most classic example of this is the French Republic. Um, this is simply the one person, one vote. You know, everybody's an equal citizen. Um, and, total separation and of religion and state. Total separation. That's a very interesting yeah. question. Yeah. The total separation of religion and state is something that I've thought about because when it comes to one unitary democratic state, this is like you know one person one vote image. It it really what it really means is that it turns into a majority system because if there's a majority of Jews and everybody's vote is equal, they'll just vote in a Jewish government all the time, um, at, or vice versa. Unless you have, of course, a parliamentary representation model, which we have now. But what it really what it makes me wonder is would this go hand in hand? with a situation where parties were disconnected from ethnicity or religion, and can that ever be implemented? I mean, we haven't managed to implement anything like that in Israel. No one's even tried. Um, and you sort of wonder, what would this region look like if there not only was one unitary democratic state with one person, one vote, but that there was no way to even you know, rig the voting to, to, to ensure either uh, you know, an ethnic major majority government at all? Um, mm -hmm. Because even in a parliamentary representation system, if the parties are formed based on ethnicity, you'll still, it, you know, you'll still manage to have the majority kind of governing the coalition. Um, and so I wonder, I, I don't even really, you know, it's hard to imagine that that's even possible, but one wonders if this one unitary democratic one person one vote state would actually have to go hand in hand with the decoupling of ethnicity or religion uh, from party politics. 
Well, I think you can often have a situation where you have inter-ethnic alliances and coalitions. It depends on the electoral system. If you maintain a, an electoral system that ensures my, um, that no one party can form a majority in the parliament, then that, that generally is going to involve uh, kind of, you know, horse trading um, and, ally and, and electoral packs and coalitions that can cross um, ethnic lines. So even when you have a situation where there are, um, you know, distinct ethnic parties, um, that doesn't necessarily ensure uh, ethnic hegemony of one particular group. No, but the horse trading can result in, in some pretty ugly coalitions. And we, we've seen yeah, those in the Israeli system. Yeah, and dysfunctional yeah, I mean, governments. Although it is worth pointing out that if there was ever to be a model like that, and I do think it's quite, I do think it's very far from reality or very far from being implemented. But if, yeah. it was, if there was a model like that and there was no decoupling of ethnicity and party politics, what you might... What we might have to take into account is that the demographics would completely change because we're looking at essentially, you know, something pretty close to parity between the Jewish and uh, and and Palestinian or Arab Palestinian populations here. Isn't it at parity right now? Right. right. Yes. Yes. I and I parity. don't think, but I think actually what what we what would be what you might see rather than kind of Jewish versus Palestinian parties, you would see some. Very strange electoral bedfellows. So, for instance, religious parties, right. Jewish and uh, ultra orthodox, exactly conservative Muslim groups. So, I think you know the the, the lines of uh, wouldn't necessarily automatic on certain issues. Maybe on 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 foreign policy issues you might see, but on many kind of domestic societal issues, uh, issues of of relationship between religion and state, you you would find you know, more uh, religiously conservative groups within both the Palestinian and Jewish population aligning against the more secular That's very true, but imagine... Economic interests would also... That's very true, but imagine what coalition negotiations would look like, though, because, of course, when you're doing coalition negotiations, you can't really think about every single issue. You've got to go into a partnership or not, so it would be quite colourful well, we, well, to find we, a couple kind of yeah, coalitions. Yeah, yeah absolutely, but we, we have an example. I mean, look at Israel today, right? Israel within the, the Green Line has such a system, and, and, and we've seen that, you know, historically over the course of its history, yeah, all sorts of strange electoral coalition. It's messy. It's unattractive to to observe. But but such a system does at least ensure that no one group dominates uh, all the time. And so even though it often results in weak and dysfunctional governments, it, it is a useful means of kind of uh, avoiding any uh, the domination of one group and therefore pushing other groups outside of the system and ultimately toward violence. Yeah, but I'm not sure if you can really say that when it comes to Israeli politics, because when it comes down to it, there is a particular demographic group that pretty much has governed Israel from day one. Yes, you had a change of power between Labour and Likud, but essentially well, it's the, the same end. demographic, exactly. And the, it, we've never really seen any shift of power towards minority, towards the Arab minority. And the, there is one minority Absolutely. that... Absolutely. I'm talking about power sharing within the Jewish population. I realize. But that's just, you know, sort of political differences. And if you're looking at, if the real question is how we look at different, you know, do we need representation for different ethnic groups? It's not a guarantee that that, that, that either of the two models that we just talked about would give it. Although, again, the consociational model is at least designed to ensure that kind of representation. Okay, well, that's time, there's time to talk about it. And Dahlia, when, when you come to New York uh, next week, we're going to have a long conversation about that. Uh, I want to talk briefly about um, the Palestinian academics who are citizens of Israel, who work and teach in Israel, and who are, you know, lo looking at um, at certain models in in you know quite a lot of detail and have written extensively about them. Um, Dalia, you've interviewed some of them. Dov, you know them as well. Um, can you speak speak a little bit about them and their work and and how? their work may, might reflect the aspirations and desires of the Palestinian minority who are citizens of, of the state of Israel. Dov, um, do you want to start? Go ahead. Well, I think, I think for, 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 for some time now, um, Palestinian um, activists and intellectuals within Israel, within the Palestinian political uh, and intellectual class within the state of Israel, have been, um, let me say, uncomfortable uh, with the notion of a two-state solution, at least as, as it was being articulated by uh, Israeli Jewish Zionist parties, uh, particularly because they feared, and I think quite correctly, that um, if implemented, uh, the two-state solution could in, would be a base would be based upon some notion of ethnic separation, and even if it didn't involve the the loss of, of Palestinian political rights and representation within Israel, could at least uh, lead to their further marginalization. 
So I think there's been a long running, going back to the disappointment with the Oslo peace process, a long running critique of uh, the ways in which a two state solution might uh, impact um, negatively the Palestinian minority within Israel. And that's led um, growing numbers of Palestinian uh, intellectuals, academics and activists, uh, not necessarily to abandon outright the two state solution, but uh, first and foremost, to call for um, recognition of the Palestinian um, Palestinian Arabs as a national minority within Israel, uh, guarantee, gu granting them uh, specific minority collective rights within Israel, including perhaps, um, you know, cultural autonomy. Um, and, and some have gone even further than that. Some have, in fact, challenged the very idea of a two-state solution and, and said, well, um, a one-state solution is better. So I think there's, a, there's you know, it's important to recognize that there are lots, that there's a very lively debate among Palestinian citizens of it, well, at least certainly among the Palestinian uh, political and intellectual class within Israel about this, um, you know, and, and you have a range of opinions from those who, who still believe a two-state solution to those who have now uh, more openly willing to advocate a one-state solution. And I think it's also important to point out that for the most part, the Arab parties have not ever openly embraced a one-state solution. Uh, it's hard to know exactly why. We do know that there are plenty of internal debates about it within, you know, various figures in the parties. But it could be because they're concerned that openly advocating one state would be interpreted as advocating the end of the Jewish state, uh, which could actually get them rejected by the Central Election Committee. But it's hard to know exactly why. They still haven't actually open, openly made that their agenda. Well, is that really? Yeah. No, I think didn't didn't someone didn't one MK from Balad just write a piece? Yeah, for Balad 92? is the closest yeah. um, in p p political party. As Dalia said, it, they they, it, they tread a very very fine line for legal reasons uh, to do that. So it's very very difficult uh, for them it, as a matter of their platform. But yeah, certainly Balad and 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 there are you know outside of the 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 uh, the parliament uh, parliamentary politics, there are various Palestinian political groups. Um, civil society groups who are more explicit in their advocacy for for one state solution. Yeah, certainly I was referring to party platforms. Yeah. Sorry, what did you say, Dalia? Certainly, I was referring to party platforms. I mean, they're individual. Right. No, no. Parties, so. I, but I think there are, there are individual activists who associate themselves with Balad, who are members of the Balad Absolutely. party, and who do yeah, you know they do advocate a one state scenario. Absolutely. That's still not the majority opinion, though. I mean, in terms of does this, how does this represent most Palestinian citizens of Israel? You know, that's not the majority opinion. Most Palestinian citizens of Israel are, are, are still supportive of a, of a two-state solution, albeit, as I said, wary about what, um, what that might mean for them, particularly given the growing, uh, the discourse of people like uh, Victor Lieberman right. um, and others that, that are now saying, you know, any kind of two-state solution has to involve a redrawing of borders such that, you know, many Palestinian citizens of Israel will eventually be stripped of their citizenship and find themselves on what they would consider the wrong side of the border, right, which namely is, in a Palestinian state and not in, in in the state of Israel. Right, which is a really a really interesting point because that conversation comes up among Jewish Israelis who will say, well, you know, what? why would these Palestinian citizens of Israel object to having the borders redrawn so that they fall under the Palestinian Authority or that, so that they become citizens of Palestine? After all, they they want us to, they want to us Jews to give them their national rights as Palestinians. So that's a, you know, that's a whole other sort of ugly little conversation that's going on within Israeli society of marginalizing people who, you know, are, are indigenous people born in the country, citizens, taxpayers, and sort of being made to feel as though they have citizenship, um, um, conditional citizenship. Yeah, that is absolutely, um, you know, one of the most sort of egregious debates going on in Israeli society. And it shouldn't even be a debate because the fact is the Arab community has pretty much ever since the beginning wanted nothing more than economic and political integration inside of Israel um, and has, you know, what with a sort of sense of ethnic or even national identification with Palestinians, they have never shown any intention towards secessionist trends. Um, and every time they're polled, they consistently say with large majorities that they prefer to remain citizens of the state of Israel. And, you know, Israel, I think that that whole conversation is essentially a way that Israelis kind of excuse them. Israeli Jews. Israeli Jews, yes, ex certainly excuse yeah. themselves or let themselves off the hook for having sort of, you know, implemented kind of a de facto and systemic discrimination against Arabs over the years, starting from martial law that was imposed on them from 1948 or 49, 48, I guess, until 1966. You know, yeah. and only one year later, of course, so after that, after that martial law was ended, the, you know, the occupation of Palestinian areas began. But I mean, even since 1966, 
Palestinian citizens do not live as equals in Israel. There are many systemic you know, modes of discrimination. Uh, it's very, you know, it's very unfortunate. And I think that that whole, that whole um, reality is part of what drives Palestinians inside Israel to embrace their Palestinian identity uh, because they are increasingly made to, increasingly, they have always been made to feel like they weren't part of Israeli society. And I think that, you know, this, this discussion of, well, they don't really want to be part of this, you know, is completely um, a sort of internal Jewish narrative that, that lets Israeli society off the hook for not doing better than it should have. Listen, many countries struggle with discrimination against certain minorities, and they, you know, hopefully they make progress towards increasing the level of integration of, of minorities, certainly when it comes to indigenous, minor, indigenous minorities. Uh, another major mistake that many people tend to make is comparing them to immigrants in, in European communities, which is, of course, absurd, because they're not. They're not immigrants. I mean, they were there yeah. first. <laughs> I would just say, I mean, just to broaden, broaden this out a little bit. So we're clearly, when we think about, you know, ways of, 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 of dealing with this conflict and, 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 and trying to move toward a resolution, um, Palestinian citizen, the Palestinian minority in Israel is one group that has historically been ignored both by Israeli governments, by the Israeli Jews and by the international community and even by the Palestinian, by the Palestinians or themselves. Palestinians uh, Authority yeah. and the PLO to some extent. Sure. Um, so they're one group who, who we have to, to, to kind of really think about how will any of these solutions impact them. There are two other groups that I think we also have to uh, bear in mind in, the, in, in, in this, which are also... Um, which will also be significantly impacted. Um, one is Palestinian refugees. Right. Uh, obviously, when we think about all of these options, um, where the refugees fall in and how and how their needs um, and aspirations can be taken into account. And again, we have at the moment a very binary, dichotomous kind of di debate, either, you know, right of return, no right of return. Um, and that, that's a really, you know, unproductive, I think, uh, discussion. And then finally, um, Jewish settlers, yeah. right, who are another very, you know, s significant group who, whose future will be seriously impacted one way or another by any of these proposed or possible solutions. So all three of those groups um, are both groups that have very, very specific interests at state that will be, I mean, uh, that will be impacted, uh, that are potentially in the present position of, of acting as spoilers in any kind of agreement because they have uh, interests that are, are going to be impacted. And that we have to think how are those specific groups going to be affected and how can not necessarily all of their needs or demands be take to, to be met, because I think that's going to be impossible, but at least to recognize that these are very specific groups that, um, that you know, that have to be uh, acknowledged um, and, and we have to think about how we can accommodate at least some of their needs. And, I think, and, and actually, you know, that, that brings us full circle back to why we started this, this way of, you know, this research to begin with. Because when you think about, certainly when you, and you ask the question of what could happen with uh, the Israelis, you know, Jewish settlers, for example. Um, you know, in, very, in, in some of these models, there might be less of a need to actually, you know, dismantle every settlement or, or, or the major settlements that are under consideration. I mean, some more of them may be able to stay if there are, if there is a, a, you know, a freer sense of freedom of residence and movement, of course, that would have to be on both sides. So, you know, I, again, we don't know if these are feasible, but that is one of the driving forces that you hear in the discourse today of why people who are fed up with the two-state solution or don't think it's realistic, why they've come to that realization, especially because the number of settlers, number of settlers has essentially doubled since the year 2000, when there were when there was yeah. no, you know when there was the Camp David negotiation that almost led to an accord. When you're talking yeah. about huge numbers at this point, I mean Yahoo himself talked about over 600,000 if you count East Jerusalem. Um, it becomes which we do. You sort of wonder where really can 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 the settlement problem ever be solved in that level? And and certainly as Dov mentioned, the refugee issue, which again you know many people don't like the comparison because there are two very different sets of historical circumstances behind the formation of both those communities, but. You know, the idea that there's a, a, a binary division between right of return or not right of return has never reflected reality. Even in the most um, mainstream two-state negotiations and debates, it's been it's never been all or nothing. There's usually the main formulas that are discussed is some number, a symbolic number might return to Israel, the rest would return to a Palestinian state, and various other options such as third country and compensation. So th these are not binary debates. There's no point in looking at the whole picture as a binary debate either. Right, and we might want to think about distinguishing between things like citizenship rights, voting right, residency rights. So, you know, people might have citizenship in one country, but be, uh, are able to enjoy residency 
uh, in others. And again, we have the EU as an example of that, right? There's there's uh, free movement of people within that, and people can uh, live and work in, in other parts of the EU while they have citizenship within one particular state, and 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 you know therefore vote within that state. So there's all sorts of ways of imagining. Um, rights and political power, and I think it's that's essentially what the, that the purpose of our of this project is is to is to kind of um, expand our imagination about the possibilities. Right, and I think that's a perfect place to close. We've been um, having this really animated and fascinating conversation for more than forty five minutes. Uh, I would love to actually continue, and I'm looking forward to doing that offline when the three of us sit down for coffee. Um, I want to thank you both, uh, Dov Waxman and Dahlia Scheindlin. You. you guys have been terrific. This has been a really fascinating and, uh, and um, elucidating conversation, really enlightening. Uh, and I, I hope that the viewers uh, feel the same way. I'm looking forward to seeing us all online talking about this. And thanks for joining me. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Lisa. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye.